Because one of the game's great personalities, Brian Johnston, sadly, is no longer with us. This BBC commentary box at Lord's was really his second home. He lived just down the road from here. He loved this place, and it was here that he gave those wonderfully warm, natural, humorous, conversational commentaries, which everybody who heard them uh, felt made them feel a bit more a part of the cricketing scene. It's no good pretending that the game is going to be quite the same without him, or that commentaries are going to be the same. Both the game and the commentaries have to go on, but we're all going to miss him. Born in Hertfordshire in 1912, Brian Johnston, the youngest son of a city merchant and what Brian described as an adorable mother, went to Eton and Oxford before entering the family coffee business. From his early days, cricket was his passion. I was first conscious of Brian Johnston uh, almost exactly 60 years ago as I'm talking now. And it was on the new college ground at Oxford and he was keeping wicket with that rather prominent proboscis of his and chatting a bit because he likes chatting. In any case, he was captain. And he was a very good wiki keeper. But although he didn't play for Oxford, or in fact for, for Eton, he was a very good club wicket keeper. Uh, and uh, in, a, in another year, he might easily have got a blue. With the Second World War imminent in 1938, Brian joined the Grenadier Guards. Lots of people knew Brian, knew him well, knew the public Brian. Many of them saw large glimpses of the private Brian, but that also was his public persona. People would know he was a CBE, a well-earned CBE. What rather few people knew was that he also had a military cross. He didn't use it. He didn't talk about it. It wasn't a military cross for any casual endeavour. He was digging tanks out of the mud under fire. And for that, he won a military cross. Not easily earned. Not many people have them. Those who do are very brave people. He had it, and he didn't flaunt it. And I think that is absolutely typical of the Brian that millions of people knew and loved. Chance meetings during the war led to Brian's joining BBC Outside Broadcasts in 1946, and some 20 million listeners every Saturday night heard his various adventures on In Town Tonight. Yes, this was a four-minute piece live. The important thing was live, live. every Saturday night, never recorded, so you had to get everything right. And I did 150 of these stupid things, and I did lots of funny things. Like what? What, what were the ones that stand out? Oh, up? well, I rode a horse bareback at the circus, and the clown lent me his quick-release trousers. So when I fell off the horse, I pulled the thing, and all my trousers came down, you know, in front of the audience. I was shaved and shampooed by the crazy gang on the stage. Really? Um, I was a bird in a flying ballet at the Empress Hall. They put a beak on me, I don't know why. And I was 60, <laughs> I was 60 feet above with a microphone. And one of my um, in town tonight was, to me, one of my great moments in broadcasting. I had a piano which I wheeled into the street and by arranging with Bud Flanagan, who I thought was a marvellous person. I got to know him very well. And he came out, put his hands on my shoulder, and it's the only tune I can play, and we sang underneath the arches. And I don't suppose anyone other than Ches who actually sang underneath the arches with Bud. So that was a great moment. The worst one was possibly when I s thought I'd see what it was like lying under a train and we, we timed it so we were going to lie under the Golden Arrow. Luckily it was a bit late and we got an electric train instead, but we had to stay on the line because it was electric we might have tripped up over it. And we had to wait for the Golden Arrow. It was very lucky it wasn't the Golden Arrow when we were on there because as it went over us, um, someone was washing their hands. At least I hoped they were and I was absolutely soused like that. <laughs> <laughs> luckily I had a Macintosh on. But <laughs> Cricket commentary was a bit less hazardous. He was a commentator from the earliest days of televised test matches, and he was there at all the great post-war games. Four runs to get. No, is it? Is it the Ashes? Yes, England have won the Ashes. And the race of all time. What a scene here. So they'd reached the battle long, all you can see is like a submarine going along with a periscope. <laughs> Hold on to that. He was loved dearly because he made everything seem like fun. And I've always said, even since I retired, that the game was meant to be, particularly cricket, was meant to be played with a, a great deal of humour. Always meant that. And John has produced it. That's Harvey at leg slip there, with his legs wide apart, hoping for a tickle. I beg your pardon. You mean a catch? I worked with Brian on televised cricket for the best part of 20 years. That was before he went back on the radio. 
which I think with his enormous spontaneity was his true métier. But on television he was a super colleague, he was always buoyant and bubbly, effervescent, irrepressibly, unrepentantly himself, dropping those all ghastly puns and telling us tales which would have delighted the junior form at school. But another thing about Brian, he had the most genuine humility. And I think that endeared him to the nation and made him such a lovable and lovely man. Richard, some people are saying this team of yours is too old. Well, I sometimes feel too old myself, <laughs> uh, Brian. No, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Uh... He joined the ship carrying Richie Benno's 1961 Australians to England in the days when travel by sea gave touring teams a chance to get to know each other and have some gentle practice. The thing that has always struck me is he never changed. Never changed in his behaviour or relationships with, uh, with anyone. Wouldn't matter if you were having a bit of a bad trot or a good trot. Always exactly the same. I really got to know him when he came out to Australia and we were playing out there and part of a touring party. And I went out with Brian on numerous occasions because we liked each other's company. And the one I always loved, which was pure genres, and we went uh, to the zoo in Melbourne and, and we saw this duck-billed platypus. Neither of us had ever seen this. We couldn't really pronounce it properly. And immediately Brian sort of looked at him and said, and then you realise that prehistoric creature's got the same nasal organ as I, myself. I mean, it was tip, pure Brian. He, he had a lovely and easy sense of humour. He was a terrific teacher, uh, not in the sense of saying, you must do this, Benners, or this is the way to do it, and so on, but just to sit back and listen to him. Uh, his great command of the English language, which was uh, one of the features of his work, and the fact that he was never flustered. He's he caught him, is he? Is he out? No. Yes, he's out. He's given out, waiting for the appeal. Can Laker get all ten? That's the question everyone's asking as he bowls to Maddox. It, he's out. Ten wickets to Laker. That's it, he's out. The first Brian Johnson was uh, something a little special, really. Something that uh, comes now and again uh, in, in the world of entertainment and things. Uh, he had a wonderful quick wit. He was a lovely storyteller. Uh, he liked people. Uh, and most of all, he loved and adored the game of cricket. Well, at 2.45 or 6, I think the West Indies just have their edge on England. But Truman has done it again. Old Fari Fred, 5 or 64. They said he was going downhill. He's certainly bowling as well as ever. So did Shackleton. And the question is now, can England make it with rarely four wickets down, although Cowdery might just come in in a dire emergency. My bet is they may oh, put everything into this. Look at him just gathering his last breath. Yes, they're sucking in there. Last ball, now. It's a draw! It's a draw, England have saved the game. And he was certainly one of the live wires of commentary. And, you know, I think a lot of people were looking forward to him coming out to Barbados to, um, to, um, to have that, um, what they call it, the thing that they do in England from the commentary, from the commentary box. You know, and I think that that was missing. But Brian was certainly a tremendous person. You know, and I, I'm sure that he would be missed in the commentary box in England, particularly this year. Jonas's other TV duties included joining the Monte Carlo rally with co-driver Richard Dimbleby. Brian did the pushing. was a great year for sport and in sports view and grandstand we introduced to you some of the great sporting figures of the world well now for boxing day we've got a very special treat i've run to earth one of the great sporting figures in the world today and he's here at the london palladium so let's go straight in and meet him wakey 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 get up please wake, wake up come on wake up what, 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 what? Ah, it wasn't me, I tell you, it was two other people. Oh, uh, hello. Hello. It's old Brian Johnson. And of course it's Harry Deacon. Hello, the largest, I mean, the greatest sportsman in the world today. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Little exaggeration. What are you doing down there, Harry? Sleeping. Really? Why, this summer day? 
I don't know. My eyes kept shutting, so I thought I might as well uh, take advantage of it. How, how's the uh, hooks? First of all, let's talk about cricket. A lot of people want to learn about it. I've seen you hit a lot of sixes. Will you demonstrate? I've brought an umbrella here. How do you play, first of all, with a straight bat? Oh, of course, yes. Well, here we go. First of all, it's, it's always essential to have a bat first. Otherwise, you can't <laughs> play with a straight one. <laughs> what a grand turn. Then you, you have it, that, the elbow well forward, you see? That's the mm -hmm. important thing. Yes. Yeah. So if the ball misses the bat, hits the elbow on your hat. <laughs> He could be solemn too, of course, when the occasion demanded. Apparently effortless, he was actually a well-prepared professional, not least on state occasions like the funeral of King George VI. And following the band of the Welsh Guards comes the detachment from the Royal Air Force, junior of the three services. And I had to say to myself during the broadcast, which is an awful thing to say now, but we have a phrase when you're describing processions, and I had to say to myself, don't say it, don't say it. And this is a phrase uh, we use a lot, and it was when the cortege came by with the coffin, I had to say to myself, don't say, here comes the main body of the procession. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I luckily didn't say it, otherwise I'd have got the sack. <laughs> Good morning to you from Putney on a really lovely morning, the sun shining, there's a crisp easterly breeze but it's very fresh and pleasant and the crowd's already gathering for this annual event here. Brown's father had been a rowing blue at the turn of the century and in 1947 BJ himself took part in the first of his 42 years of boat race broadcasts both on television and radio. Oh John Snag, you say in, out, in, out. <laughs> But I'm very lucky to have the experts like Tom Sutton, who's done it for 30 years. This is his last boat race, too. And he was with John Snag all that time and now with me. And on this race, we have old uh, toppers, Dan Topolsky. And uh, I bring in them when I get stuck. <laughs> Brian was a great leg puller. And um, he, he, here, we all love to pull the leg of uh, E.W. Jim Swanton, one of our television colleagues. The idea was that we were going to pull his leg at the Kent match at Canterbury. Willing accomplice, Peter Richardson, the Kent and England opener, himself a, a practical joker of some renown, was in on the act. It was arranged that when uh, Jim Swanton came on the air, taking up the microphone, a handkerchief should be dropped uh, on the scaffolding as a sign to Peter Richardson batting there left-handed for Kent. So Peter Richardson, as soon as he saw the handkerchief, took strike to one or two deliveries and then held up his hand, walked down the pitch to the umpire at the bowler's end. He was umpire also in the act and said there's a booming noise coming from the commentary box and it's upsetting my concentration and I can't continue. So the umpire brings the game to a shuddering halt, walks over to the commentary box underneath and says there's a booming noise coming out from there. Well, of course, Jim, because he knew what was going on, and he took it marvellously well. And Brian was falling about, Dennis was, so was I, and uh, Brian couldn't have been more thrilled to report a first-class match to a temporary halt. <laughs> he was very upset when um, he was asked to relinquish his duties as a television cricket commentator and I remember having to write him a letter and, and say that you know, thank him very much for all he'd done but that the style had changed and we wanted to go from the rather jokey commentary on television uh, to the more professional cricket commentators and uh, I don't think he really ever understood it but of course we did him a favour because he then went back to radio and Test Match Special uh, was an enormous success. Also, I think Brian had the knack of being everyone's friend. You felt when you listened to him on the radio or saw him on television that he's someone that you would love to have sitting beside you. He's always full of fun. And I, well, television commentators like Brian Johnson and radio commentators, he is a very, very special one. Yes, with John Arlott, Brian Johnson made Test Match Special worthy of its title. The voice became better known even than the face. This is the first time I think that uh, anyhow any Ashes winning team has sung a song. I hope you'll call it singing when you hear it. What's it like artistically? Oh, very good indeed. Um, there's one poet in the party, we won't mention name, who doesn't approve all the lyrics, but basically they're jolly good. We brought the Ashes back home. We got them here in the earth. The Aussies have had them 12 years, so it was about our turn. But oh, what a tough fight, it's been 
it in the dazzling sunlight. In spite of the booze of the mob on the hill, we won by two matches to nil. Have John has brought that element of fun, and it's impossible not to listen to John's on the radio and not have a smile on your face, regardless of what he was talking about. And he opened the whole game up. It was more than simply 11 men out in the middle trying to dismiss two men with a couple of umpires. You know, there was everything going on around the edge. There was a crowd, there was something happening you know, outside the ground. Uh, it was, it was a, a little sort of drama in itself, but always with that little trace of humour going through it. And uh, I think that's what John said. He was a wonderful ambassador for the game from that point of view, because I'm sure a lot of people tune into Test Match Special really not enjoying cricket at all. I think cricket's probably the most boring game on earth, but they, they could listen to John as easily for 20 minutes because he brought so much more to his commentary than simply cricket. I must say that I still love her because she makes such a marvellous marmalade cake, and thank you very much for not sending us some, the, the Reverend Trotton. Anyhow, thanks for the letter. When Brian came into the box in 1970 on a regular basis, he transformed the place from being a rather dour broadcasting mini-studio, a very decrepit one, you see, with dead insects and nothing to eat, it became a sort of cavern of comedy and uh, cake and we all got nicknames and instead of being a sort of uh, silent person who passed messages on little cakes I became the stooge nicknamed Bearders and um, well, I was delighted to be his stooge in fact uh, now he's, he's gone I, I know how Ernie Wise felt after Eric Morecambe had left us as Doshi comes up and bells and Gar off the back foot flicks us off his toes and he goes down for one run to Ben Saka and that's 36 now to go, and the score is 158 for two. Oh. And I raised this up, and the most appalling sight, uh, it was, I think, a cake, and it's all been mashed up, and it's now strawberries and cream strawberries on a chocolate taste. But that's very good indeed. I shall get my nose into that in the trough later. But, uh, and we welcome well served with the news that we've just been placed a chocolate cake in front of us, which has been uh, mashed up into some strawberries and cream. Well, thank you very much, somebody, for that. And uh, well, service the news is that England are batting. Brian's influence was all the bubbling fun in the back of the commentary box and the sort of attitude to the whole program. And uh, I think that has certainly got to us all. All those of us who worked with him will, I'm sure, have been affected by it. It affects the way we work now, probably in ways that we almost don't know ourselves. It certainly affects our relaxed approach to microphones. I think all of us who have done it are uh, the more relaxed as broadcasters because we worked with Brian. And the ball goes through very low to not, and it has been going through low that end, and in fact, the two slips are standing very close to the stumps compared with them, what they have been. Yes, uh, but the, the odd delivery uh, to Viv Richards, uh, that bounced to, yes. uh, from just short of length. Uh, I was broadcasting at Lord's uh, in the test match, and he was hovering on my right-hand side, and of course, if Brian is hovering, uh, you've been with him long enough to know there's something afoot. And the th thing he did, he very slowly, and he pushed a full chocolate cake off the top while I was in midstream uh, uh, describing something. And I caught it in both hands and carried on broadcasting. And his face, it was a picture. I like his commentary. I think, I think it's nice to have different types of commentary, different types of people. Uh, him not being an ex-cricketer of some standing, he didn't try to involve himself in technique and the technicalities of the game, but he brought out the best comments from people who had played the game, and then he added his own sense of humour. He was always a funny, enjoyable man, nice company. I, I, he always had a kind word for everybody. That was the nice thing about him. What did you get, an MA? No, I got a BCom. What's a BCom? Uh, a Bachelor of Commerce. You become a BA, you become a... BCom. <laughs> <laughs> I had a letter after the West Indies that played the over from someone who signed herself Miss Mainpiece, which I thought was rather extraordinary. But anyhow, she said, Mr. Johnson, she said, I enjoy your um, commentaries very much. You must be more careful. A lot of young people listened in. Do you know what you said the other day? And uh, she then said, well, when we came over, Michael Helding was bowling to Peter Willie. And you said, welcome to the Oval. Well, the bowler's holding the batsman's Willie. <laughs> When you talk about commentators, when you, when you listen to commentators on the times on the chance you do have to listen to them, then someone like Brian you can enjoy. There was no malice in Brian, he was always looking for the best in players. If you actually played a bad shot or if someone out there committed a grievous sin in cricketing terms, it wouldn't quite sound that way if Brian was talking about it. It might be just a minor aberration or probably you can forgive him later, all that sort of stuff. And therefore he had the ability to make the whole game appealing. Um, and there was no real sense of genuine 
harsh criticism when you're talking about Brian Johnson. So from that point of view, players would have appreciated his style. And I think anyone listening to him would say, OK, fine, well, um, he might not have been the world's greatest test player ever. But you don't need to be a test player necessarily to be a good broadcaster. And that's what Brian was. He was a genuinely good, clean, honest broadcaster. Well, I remember I once said, you've come over here and you've just missed seeing um, Barry Richards hit one of Dollar Bearer's balls clean out of the crowd. <laughs> And someone says, ha, 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 the back. <laughs> I've always uh, respected his, um, his sense of, um, of, 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 of timing. And not just maybe his sense of timing whilst giving commentary, but I think he's a wonderfully warm sort of individual. You never seem to hear a rash word, maybe like some of the other comment commentators made about, uh, about uh, players. What I think he was mostly interested in was the fact that he could, was able to describe the game of cricket and the people who were involved playing it. A chap wrote to me from Belgium, said he'd been listening, and he was trying to teach cricket to the Belgians in his car, and they heard me say, Ray Inningworth's coming on now, and he's got two short legs, one of them square. And this woman said, well, you know, well, why be rude about his disabilities? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is very difficult. The first test match at Lord's every year. That was something special to him. And his dress, he had the most immaculate blue blazer, powers, beautifully cut, brown and white shoes, and he would walk through W.G. Grace with a huge grin on his face about quarter to ten on the first day of the tour's test. Lovely. We go along, five of us, to go and watch a cricket match like anybody else, and uh, if someone tells us an amusing story or we see an attractive blonde, we'll talk about her. Or if someone offers us a glass of something to drink, we probably have it, not too much, but a little. So we hope that um, uh, they enjoy watching the cricket with us, because cricket is number one. Uh, can you tell us what is happening regarding the coverage of Test Match Special? Down Your Way rapidly became molded to that personality too, from the moment he succeeded Franklin Engelman in 1972. This week the Dino Way team is in Gloucestershire to visit the small town of Winchcombe. Can I pull it? Yeah. Branded 15 years of Dino Way, retiring so as not to break Franklin Engelman's record of 733 programmes. He chose Lords for the finale. called Emily Brewster who was a hundred and I went to see her and she was surrounded by all her great grandchildren and everything and uh, I said did you have a good birthday she said yes lovely birthday I said you get a telegram from the Queen she said yes I did but I was a bit disappointed so I said oh why she said it wasn't in her own handwriting she wrote. <laughs> his sense of humor was unusual it was a sense of humor that you could equate with whether you were 12 or 92 and in many ways he was arch typically English Hard to put a reason behind it, but when you saw Brian Johnston, you would have thought to yourself, that is an Englishman. Uh, I never failed to think that whenever I saw him. But he did have this gift of communication, I and mean, then it was a communication at all levels. It doesn't matter whether you were sophisticate or not. There was that direct level of communication that very few people achieve. Many people thought perhaps it was just uh, a rather amateurish performance, but it wasn't. It was intensely professional and he hit the audience in a way few people ever do. And the West Indies 221 for 7, which means there's still 149 runs behind. At one time he looked rather black for them. They were 105 for 5, but we've had a good partnership today with Backus making 61 and Marshall 45. They both batted very well indeed, with the wicket playing very easily, taking a little spin, but not much, but a T221 for 7, still 100. BJ's essential Englishness embraced a natural charity towards his fellow man. Do unto others as you would be done by was his guiding philosophy, and he gave of his time and personality generously. That's Alan. Alan. That's Alan. Alan. That's George. George. I know George. Huh? Your figure's good, George, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ready, Kate? Blind cricketers perhaps had a special affection for Johnners, but he worked hard for many a charity, not least the Lord's Taverners. Well, Brian was a good supporter of the Lord's Taverners. Um, he would turn up on many occasions and do speeches after dinner, turns, and was a, was a very big draw. So he certainly put his great popularity to 
great practical use. And the Lord's Taverners were just one of many charities that benefited. I have an addiction, I must admit, besides cricket. Go on. <laughs> neighbours. Half a mind to watch neighbours, and I'm told that's all you need. <laughs> No, you want to have a double mind, you see, they have a lot of rows, but they all finish in about a week, and they all say sorry, which I think is rather nice. You talk about a person being irreplaceable, and you don't normally mean it. I think this is one of the very few times uh, you can say it's true, because there will never be another Brian Johnston. He was unique. He tried to step over the stumps and just flipped a bale with his, with his right. He Mollis tried to do the splits over it and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bale. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. Agus, do stop it. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batting for 30, 35. <laughs> 35 minutes, hit a four over the week keepers. <laughs> Angus, for goodness sake, stop it. <laughs> yes, Lawrence, well, Lawrence, right. <laughs> suit me well. He <laughs> hit a four over the week keeper's head, <laughs> and he was out for the other. And Tuffle came, <laughs> batted for 12 minutes, and then was caught by Haynes on Patson for two, and there were 54 extras. And take them all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. So much fun was given to so many people for so long by this devoted family man of high principles. Brian Johnston was a great Englishman, a unique broadcaster, and a born entertainer. And to show that I'm very pleased to meet you, I hope you're pleased to meet me, I'm just going to finish on a song, which goes like this. Columbus discovered America, Hudson discovered New York, Benjamin Franklin discovered the spark, which Edison discovered would light up the dark. Oh, Marconi discovered the wireless telegraph across the ocean blue, but the greatest discovery was when you discovered me, and I discovered you. Thank you very much. Good night.